ahead and record the session. Um, we have uh, quite a number of topics to cover tonight. Uh, go ahead, Joan. Do you know if any of the books that you recommend are in Spanish? Uh, Gregor's books, I think, uh, or at least his website has a Spanish website. I looked in the front of How Not to Die and it didn't say anything about it, but I thought I'd ask. I, uh, You know, he, do you know, Scott? I don't, yeah, I would guess, I thought it was available in multiple languages. I guess you'd maybe just Google it or go on Amazon and see, searching for it, if it's available in Spanish. Okay, I have a second question. Um, I have a, a friend that has been fighting uh, prostate cancer, and I would like to introduce this person to whole food plant-based. Would you recommend How Not to Die is the first book to give this person? Yeah, if he's interested in the academic side, you might show him, um, if he just wants some inspiration first before reading How Not to Die, you could uh, watch the, show him the Marshall Plan, that that movie. Okay. It's called the Marshall Plan. It's yeah, just, I saw it at a potluck. Right, yeah, that, that was the mayor. The mayor of Marshall, Texas, had early stage. They had prostate cancer, and he reversed it with a plant based diet. But just for that inspiration piece. Oh, and nice. then you could even, and then you could also refer him to um, Dr. Dean Ornish's work. He did a randomized controlled trial, just like he showed reversal of heart disease. The, the next second set of randomized controlled trials he did was on reversing early stage prostate cancer with the same diet and lifestyle. So, so that's a high level of evidence to randomize controlled trial. And then, then maybe show just as an, I just, my recommendation, those two things, and then give them how not to die. And read so that. Dean, Dean Ornish, is that, um, does he have a video or what does he have on the prostate issue? We could, uh, you know, you could either um, go to his website or he could just do uh, a, a search uh, could type in either go on to PubMed and type in um, Dean Ornish uh, reversal of prostate cancer. Uh, well, you could probably find it there, or even if you just Googled it, if you did like a you know randomized controlled trial reversal of prostate cancer, Dean Ornish, kind of some of those search terms, you'd probably actually find the published art, the published study that 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 summarizes the study. That did, he did his study take? Um patients that had been dealing with this for some time, just like Esselstyn took patients that had been dealing with heart issues for some time? Well, his study was mostly early stage. So people that were fairly okay. newly diagnosed with prostate cancer because the only way he could get it through the ethics board was to have people that in a randomized controlled trial to say, okay, this group of people, they're going to do the lifestyle intervention. This group of people you know, it's early stage prostate cancer. They're just going to, it's the people that you would just kind of monitor. You would like to show them, oh, we, you know, here's your PSA. Let's just keep an eye on it and just monitor it over time. It's not an aggressive type. It's one you can just kind of uh, watch, you know, so because you okay. couldn't ethically, somebody that had a really aggressive form, you wouldn't be able to ethically say, oh, we're not going to give you any treatment, right? you know, and compare it that way. So uh, I think that's what how they designed the study, but but then it showed, yeah, it showed not only the uh, PSAs going down, but the sometimes they often saw the the lesions go away in the prostate. And then then they what was really huge was they did all a bunch of genetic uh, genes. They they did over tested over four hundred genes, and it showed the people in the in the interventional group the the life the whole food plant based diet and lifestyle change. They actually turned on genes that suppress pr prostate cancer and turned off genes that promote prostate cancer. So they actually showed from a genetic standpoint, a gene map that showed at the effects that you could turn on and off genes based on the lifestyle as well. So that that was, uh, what he did that work with Dr. Craig Venter, who is was one of the uh, scientists that mapped the human genome. So he he always gets really high profile, credible people to do to work with when he does his, his studies. Thank you. So in the You're chat, uh, Google Ornish Lifestyle Medicine to find the links. Okay. Deb. Thank, thank you. Deb. I think Alice. you were there, but I don't think Deb was there. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Is, is there someone else who'd like to uh, say something, Karen? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to fix my computer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep fixing it. Glad to have you. Uh, is there anybody else who's uh, new uh, to the classes, first time perhaps, wants to let us know how you found out about the class? Just okay. kind of curious, just unmute and say hello. Heidi? Hi, everybody. Um, I was referred to you by a friend of mine. Um, I think she knows you, Charlie, uh, Tiffany O'Donnell. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we we go back to sophomore year. We've been friends for forty years, so uh, spent some time with her this weekend, and I uh, was talking to her about my diet and things, and she recommended joining the group. Well, say hello to her for me, I, and tell her that we really miss her, and uh, uh, glad to hear her name. Yeah, good person, and I'm just thrilled to be here. So You're thank welcome. you, and thank you for. Uh, I think it was. Uh, Scott, maybe that forwarded me the uh, newsletter. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so all is good, and I was happy to be here tonight. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I think I recognize most of the rest of the names, but if uh, someone else has something uh, to speak up, Karen, yes. are you still? Um, checking or because you're unmuted and do you want to tell us about uh, an upcoming uh, shopping event grocery tour sure <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> now so, could be an opportune time <laughs> so I'm Karen Booth I'm a clinical dietitian at McKenzie Willamette and in April, I believe it's on the 26th, um, we're, we'll be having a grocery store tour. And I'm not gonna tell you where because we request that you sign up and we'll tell you then. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be at six in the evening. And um, Sean Eaglestone, he's done one of the other classes for you, for you on um, label reading. He'll be there and he and I will lead the tour. I've been to the tour and it's wonderful. And thank you for doing that. And I'll show you real quick. If you want to sign up, I'll show you guys the uh, website. So here's the, of course, the class website. Uh, you can either scroll down to get to the Eugene Plant-Based Providers website, or it's just eugeneplantbasedproviders.com. And real simple, and you go to the homepage here, and then you'll see upcoming events up here at the top. So you click on upcoming events. Here it is. And then you just, uh, and it's Wednesday, April 24th. Just put your name and email and click send. And they're only, it's limited to the first 20 people. So uh, sign up if you're interested in doing that. I've, I've gone on a couple of them with those, those two and they're, they do a great job. And I think you'll find it very, very valuable. And it's good price, it's free. Thanks, Scott. Anybody else have um, anything you'd like to add? Uh, any questions you might have before we get started? Having difficulty with anything or having success with something or whatever? Alice here. So I, uh, you know, I was trying the whole vegan thing. I was hungry, 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 sad and hungry. And um, I talk to my vegan friends and they're like, oh yeah, well, I do protein shakes like pea protein shakes, which to me is way too processed. And every time I get suckered into buying <laughs> protein powder, you know, I go to some like demo, they're sampling, oh, that doesn't taste too bad. And I buy it. And then by the time I finish that bottle, I hate it and I never want to look at it. <laughs> Ugh, they're horrible and they usually have like some kind of sweetener that doesn't agree with me like stevia or something like that. anyway 
And then I talked to another vegan friend of mine and she's like, oh yeah, well, I added back some fish and this and that. So I, 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 I've been, and I, uh, Michael Pollan calls it a, what is he called? A flexitarian. That's the uh -huh. word. Is. And yeah. he, he says the data says that a little bit of, a little bit of something, something, uh, isn't so bad you know the data says it's not that different so i'm i'm i was really hungry and and i had some meat and i had some broccoli with melted cheese and it tasted so lovely and good and i felt so guilty it was so good and so bad and anyway so i don't know I'm, that's that's where i'm at and and speak to being a flexitarian okay so you're not alone uh, this is not, you know, you're not bad. Uh, the bottom line is, is if you otherwise are not taking any pills, you don't have medical problems, you're otherwise healthy, you can live uh, and eat like the Blue Zones, which are 90, 95% whole food, plant-based, and they do have some animal products uh, in their diet, but they've been doing it since the time they were young, you know, infants pretty much and they live long, healthy lives. If you take someone who's been living in the good old US of A, eating the standard American diet fare, uh, the meat sweet diet, they tend to develop, as you know, a number of uh, diseases, uh, chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, um, hyperlipidemia, the metabolic syndrome, arthritis, and so for people who are taking pills, we encourage them to go uh, 100% completely uh, to try to wean them off of their pills. And then if they want to choose to go back and add some other things back in their diet, see how their life goes, they do an experiment on themselves and see how they feel. Now, it's really common when you're first transitioning to feel hungry uh, because you're used to, well, I don't want to eat too much potatoes. It has too much carbohydrate. So you don't tend to eat the quantities of whole plant foods that you need to get enough calorie density uh, to be satisfied. Uh, if you looked at the foods that I'm eating, uh, the amount of um, legumes, the amount of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, you'd say, wow, I don't know if I could eat that much. Uh, and uh, it's come kind of gradually for me, although we did make a complete transition uh, in a day. Um, we've kind of increased what we are eating overall. So, um, you know, some people do what you're doing and it becomes, uh, I know like for myself, uh, I was kind of addicted to ice cream. So... I like ice cream and so and you like cheese. So what happens is the next meal, well, I'll just have it again. And some people are able to moderate what they're eating and other people are not. Uh, they um, have some stresses in their life. They do comfort eating and they start resorting back to uh, overeating those foods that they may have been able to eat what you might call moderation, uh, Pollock's uh, philosophy, perhaps. And uh, it becomes sort of like torture. Uh, and, and also this issue of I'm not okay, I am okay, you know, going through that stuff. We don't really want you to have to go through that. We want you to be healthy and, um, you know, just keep reading and listening to the science. Uh, and make a decision as to what you think is most important. Scott, do you have anything else to add? No, I think you summed it up well. Just uh, like we always talk about people that are always feeling hungry, got to eat more of the, the higher calorie density whole plant foods, you know, the beans, the legumes, the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the intact whole grains like quinoa, and brown rice and oats and all those barley and because those foods are all 400 to 600 calories a pound whereas if you're not embracing those foods i just mentioned then you're 
eating non-starchy vegetables, which are only about 100 calories a pound, and you're, you're just never going to get enough calories and feel satisfied, you just can't eat enough. So you got to really embrace the, no, the I starchy vegetables. I did. But and I would be full at the meal, but within a couple of hours, I was hungry again. So I, for me in my life, I like to have three meals a day, and not like four or five because I just I don't have enough time. I'm too busy. I mean, I love eating. I make time for meals, but I, I don't have time for five meals a day. You know, I'm like, and I'm in a, the you know place where I don't have access to something that I want to eat, you know, I don't want to buy some snack food because I'm out, right. out kind of thing. So I was, I guess it's, I'd be hungry very quickly, like when the flowers. I guess it's, it's hard because every person can only put so much into their stomach. And so if you, if you ate as much as Charlie and I did at a meal, I can, I can eat two meals a day because I eat a large amount, you know, and, and it's mostly the starchy vegetables and, you know, other fruits and vegetables, but you know, it's a, it's a, but I can eat a lot where my wife can only, she has to eat three meals because she can't put as much in her stomach as I can. So it, it, I have to say though, it took practice when I was first transitioning. I, what I felt was hunger was really toxic hunger, which is basically withdrawing. I was withdrawing from the high sugar, salt, fat foods that I was eating, processed foods I was eating previously. And so what I felt was hunger in the first, this is in the first you know few weeks to the first couple of months, I, it was really not true hunger. It was more the toxic hunger, which is kind of withdrawing from the, the foods that I was used to eating, like really high in calorie density, more processed. And, and so that was, I had to learn that over time, but I would have to say when I got more in, in tune with my true hunger and I could, you know, eat a fair amount of food, then I can go hours. I mean, I can eat my groats in the morning with all the berries and everything in it. And I can go four or five, six hours and really not feel all that hungry and then until I eat again. So, but I, it, it wasn't that way in the beginning, but so I don't know if that's, if that is your case or not, but again, it's, there's so many variables, how much you can eat in one sitting and whatnot. So Alice, keep, keep at it though. Alice, I've come to eat two meals a day and then maybe a snack in the afternoon if I'm really active for the day. Um, and, and so uh, what Scott said is, I agree completely with. There's one other factor that I'd like to mention, and that's the issue of fiber. And I don't know that Michael Pollitt actually addresses fiber a lot. Uh, um, fiber is so important for anti-inflammatory effects. Fiber is the food for your microbiome, for those organisms that feed you back butyrate, the anti-inflammatory chemical, that comes back and tells your brain, hey, you know, I'm full. Uh, I've had enough to eat and also cuts down inflammation. Also, those bacteria in your microbiome are producing serotonin. Uh, so the statistics show uh, for every 10 grams of fiber you add to your diet, you're reducing your heart attack risk by 10% because you're reducing cholesterol levels. You're reducing your breast cancer risk by about 8% because of the reduction in uh, excess estrogen, you're reducing your colon cancer risk by 10% for every 10 grams of fiber. So when you're eating an animal product, you get zero fiber. So it is a choice that you get to make. You want to ultimately reduce and maximize uh, <laughs> your health by reducing the risk of some of these chronic illnesses by eating more plant foods. And or do you want to continue on with the foods that you really do enjoy? And it pr is a personal decision you get to make. You should not feel guilty. But that's how I kind of keep focusing my attention. Fiber, fiber, fiber. And that's 60, 80, 100 grams of fiber a day in the uh, communities that have the lowest incidence of chronic illness. Wow. Remind me why eggs, why you... you Eggs are not desirable. What, why? What is not? Eggs. Chicken eggs. E eggs. Eggs. Uh, zero fiber again. 200 milligrams of cholesterol, um, which is, you know, if you're getting it from no other thing and you want to have an egg, and it's animal protein. So again, it's the lack of fiber. And, you know, it's not that one egg is going to, bump you off, uh, but some people, they eat one egg and they eat more than that. Three, four, five, increased rates of prostate cancer. 
uh, that's what the statistics show. So uh, I can't remember others. Uh, Scott, do you have any other issues about the eggs? Well, there's lots of me with the IGF-1 because of the animal protein, insulin light growth factor one, which is a cancer promoter. It also contains choline, which choline with your gut microbiome turns into TMAO, trimethylamine anoxide, which drives the dense cholesterol particles into your arterial wall. And you can also go to nutritionfacts.org and just type in search eggs. And he has a whole series of, uh, Dr. Greger has a whole series of videos on eggs and why the egg board can't even call them healthy, can't call them nutritious because they because they get government subsidies. So they have to tell the truth, so to speak. So there's a whole really interesting video set of videos on eggs you could watch on nutritionfacts.org. Alice, now you know I love having Scott in the room with me. <laughs> I think you had said choline. I think yes. that's the thing you had mentioned before. And I was like, I couldn't remember now. What did he say and why? And so I thought, I'm just going to ask. I, I, Yeah, I got the book, How Not to Diet. Uh, and but and I'm, I started reading that one. Okay, that's good. a good book. And then How Not to Age. You're really going to want to see that or read that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, his newest book. It, it has, I think, uh, is it 5,000 references? Uh, 13,000. 13,000 <laughs> references. Uh, I think that's the set of How Not to Die, How Not to Diet, and, and uh, How Not to Age, 13,000. No, actually... Is it? No, that's not. No, it's thirteen thousand just for how not. Just to for age. how not to age. Yes. Okay, you'll just be in seventh heaven being able to review all this article. <laughs> well, I, I want to give a shout out to Scott. I signed up for a bike race. Uh, oh, hey, all right. Nice. I, I mean, I will probably be the last person, uh, and that's okay. Somebody has to be last, but I did sign up. For a race, oh, like a like a like a group ride. No, no, no. Um, it's called the Bogus Basin Hill Climb, and oh, it's yeah. the, um, it's an eighteen mile race to our ski hill because I'm in Boise, Idaho, and um, it's um, it's got like um, oh, probably maximum is eight percent grade, but it's a hard race. Cool um oh yeah, yeah. not all eight percent it's like it starts out six percent i can't get my video and i can't hear in my earphones <laughs> well sorry about the interruption there but it's nancy, too we're, we're uh we're gonna continue on nancy you've been really patient and marcia next and then we'll keep going yeah so um i have i have to say that my guilty pleasure so to speak when I'm when I'm around the house and I just want to snack on something I just get the dry oatmeal from my oatmeal canister and chew on that it's chewy and and the kind I get right the kind I have right now and I'm like uh should I be eating so much oatmeal but uh oh well <laughs> yes but, you, um, you can eat the oatmeal <laughs> Dry. It's got a lot of soluble fiber and a lot of fiber, and it's oh, it's a, that's, that's it's why a, I've been uh, using the bathroom a lot, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a healthy choice. So anyway, so I've been watching. Um, I don't know if any of you have discovered it. This guy, he has um, a series of videos. Um, he's called plant. It's called Plant Chompers, and. He had, because um, there's so many people that, well, how do you get your protein? Are you getting enough protein as a vegan? And all that kind of stuff. And they, he went over some research on that. And basically, it doesn't matter how you get your protein. They were, they were doing like bodybuilders and stuff like that. And it, it turned out the same. The problem with, because, you know, I've, several places I've read, oh, older people don't get enough protein, you know. and so I, um, what, what, what it said was the problem with that is because when you're older, you end up like hurt or in bed or something, you know, more frequently than with a younger person and 10 days of, you know, bed rest and you have lost a heck of a lot of muscle. 
And then when you try to put it back on, you only put on half as much as what you, you know, originally had. And um, so I, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it, it, as long as you're getting adequate protein, which, you know, isn't more than, you know, they, they say, <laughs> unless you're trying to be a bodybuilder, then you need extra protein. If but, you eat um, enough calories, you're getting enough protein. If you're eating plants, yeah, eat enough as long calories, as, as long you get enough. You're not eating junk food. Correct. Eating yeah. whole plant foods. Eat enough so you're not hungry. You'll get enough protein. And so anyway, that was it. Was it was quite interesting to to listen to him talking about how um, plant protein is just as good as animal protein, as right. far as your body's concerned. Thanks for but, sharing. Okay, what? Monica or Marsha. Have you heard of Dr. Neil Bernard's new book, <clears throat> The Power Foods Diet? No, I haven't. Yeah, it just came, it just came out, but yeah, I haven't I haven't picked it up. Yeah. But Neil Bernard it's, 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 is an excellent author and wonderful to listen to, and whatever he's done is probably great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, anybody else? We're good. Uh, today, we've got a lot of topics that we're going to try to cover. Um, if we get to them, fine. If we don't get to them, well, I guess there's next week. Uh, but we're going to be starting out with kind of a video review of what we've done the last couple weeks. And then we're going to be talking about uh, why sh we should care about positive emotions. We're going to talk about um, becoming what you believe. Uh, and we're also going to be discussing forgiveness tonight. So hopefully we'll get around to that and hopefully we'll have some input from you in the audience uh, sharing some of your thoughts. Uh, that's the my ultimate goal for this class. So to get started, we're going to just kind of do a kind of a review uh, that it's um, a Gregor video. And the video is plant-based diets for improved mood and productivity. So fire away. A 2014 systematic review and meta-analysis of dietary patterns and depression concluded that a healthy diet pattern was significantly associated with reduced odds of depression. But out of the 21 studies they could find in the medical literature, they were only able to find one randomized controlled trial, considered the study design that provides the highest level of evidence. And it was the study I profiled in Improving Mood Through Diet, in which removing meat, fish, poultry, and eggs improved several mood scores in just two weeks. We've known that those eating plant-based tend to have healthier mood states, less tension, anxiety, depression, anger, hostility, and fatigue. But you couldn't tell if it was cause and effect until you put it to the test, which they finally did. But what could account for such rapid results? Well, eating vegetarian does give you a better antioxidant status, which may help with depression. Also, uh, as I previously addressed, how consumption even a single carbohydrate-rich meal can improve depression, tension, anger, confusion, sadness, fatigue, alert, and calmness scores among patients with PMS. But what about long-term? Overweight men and women were randomized into a low-carb, high-fat diet, or a high-carb, low-fat diet for a year. By the end of the year, who had less depression? Anxiety, anger, and hostility, feelings of dejection, tension, fatigue, better vigor, less confusion, or mood disturbances. The low-carb dieters are represented by the black circles, and the low-fat dieters are represented in the white. These sustained improvements in mood in the low-fat group compared with the low-carb group are consistent with results from epidemiological studies showing that diets high in carbohydrates, low in fat and protein, are associated with lower levels of anxiety and depression, and have beneficial effects on psychological well-being. But the overall amount of fat in their diet didn't change in this study, though, but the type of fat did. Their arachidonic acid intake 
fell to zero. Arachidonic acid is an inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid that can adversely impact mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation. It may inflame our brain. High blood levels in the bloodstream have been associated with a greater likelihood of suicide risk, for example, and uh, major depressive episodes. How can we stay away from this stuff? Well, Americans are exposed to arachidonic acid primarily through chicken and eggs. But when you remove chicken and eggs and other meat, we can eliminate preformed arachidonic acid from our diet. So while high-quality treatment studies investigating the impact of diet on depression are scarce, there is that successful two-week trial. But even better, how about 22 weeks? Overweight or diabetic employees of a major insurance corporation received either weekly group instruction on a whole food plant-based diet or no diet instruction for five and a half months. Uh, there was no portion size restriction, no calorie counting, no carb counting, no change in exercise, no meals were provided, but the company cafeteria did start offering daily options such as lentil soup, minestrone, bean burritos. No meat, eggs, dairy, oil, or junk, yet they reported greater diet satisfaction compared with the control group participants who had no diet restrictions. How'd they do, though? More participants in the plant-based intervention group reported improved digestion, increased energy, better sleep than usual at uh, week 22 compared with the control group. They also reported a significant increase in physical functioning, general health vitality, and mental health. Here's this all kind of represented graphically, where the plant-based group beat out controls on nearly every measure. There was also significant improvements in work productivity, thought to be due in large part to their improvements in health. So what this study demonstrated was that a cholesterol-free diet is acceptable not only in research settings, but in a typical corporate environment, improving quality of life and productivity at little cost. All we need now is a large randomized trial for confirmation, but we didn't have such a thing until now. Ten corporate sites across the country, from San Diego to Macon, Georgia, same kind of setup as before. Can a plant-based nutrition program in a multi-center corporate setting improve uh, depression, anxiety, and productivity? Yes. Significant improvements in depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, and daily functioning. Lifestyle interventions have an increasingly apparent role in physical and mental health, and among the most effective of these is the use of plant-based diet. Okay, uh, we're going to stop there, see if there's anybody who has any uh, questions or comments after that video. Just uh, either raise your hand or unmute yourself or say hello or whatever you'd like to do. Wow. <laughs> okay, uh, you are impressed. Apparently. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what have I got here? Uh, oh, there we are. Um, Fire away, galaxy. One thing I've discovered about emptiness timing and uh, eating it up is eating on time. Eating, it's like if you wait until you're thirsty, you're dehydrated. And if you wait until you're hungry, you've waited too long. At least I have. And so if I just go ahead and make the food and eat it, I'm... I settle down real fast. I'm much happier than if I wait until I'm starving or feel like I'm starving. Well, thanks for adding that. There may be others who feel like you do, and we want to, you know, mm -hmm. many of us have differing ways of getting through this world, so it's good to hear from you. Anybody else? All right. Um, we'll be back again. Uh, I'm gonna, I guess, talk to the group. Um, how am I gonna talk to the group? I'm gonna spend a little time as the speaker and talk to you about positive psychology.
We mentioned this a little bit the last time uh, when we were talking about baseball players and baseball cards. And if you recall, uh, they did a study in which they took those baseball cards and the baseball players that had the big broad smile, compared them with the deadpan faced baseball players and uh, looked in uh, to see when they died. And the group uh, uh, with the smile on their face had a life expectancy, I believe it was about seven years longer. There was another study like that, that um, of nuns' diaries. They kind of took the diaries of nuns and those that had positive uh, sounding diaries lived longer than those who had more negative thoughts. So the bottom line is that's why we should care about positive emotions, which support positive health outcomes through healthy lifestyle behavior and uh, maybe some direct physiological processes. Optimism is associated with up to a, an 15% in increased longevity. So if there's something you can do to improve the length of time you're on this planet and hopefully uh, make it healthier for you, uh, you can work on, on your emotions to become more positive and less negative. Um, Martin Seligman is a psychologist who came up uh, with a mnemonic called PERMA. And this mnemonic was supposed to um, identify kind of the um, pillars of how you could flourish in this world, not just survive, but how you could actually lead a life uh, of living well, the high, that high ideal of living life well. And uh, PERMA is, stands for, P, the P in PERMA is for positive emotions. And these positive emotions can be developed uh, by how you think about yourself, um, how you focus your thoughts on gratitude, uh, how you find joy in your life. Very important uh, concepts, actually. Um, so they're, the positive emotions are like a capstone to healthy lifestyle. Among them could be emotions like joy, uh, I said gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and love. So if you kind of focus your attention on, on shifting your emotions in those directions, uh, it will be helpful for your overall health. The E in PERMA is dealing with engagement. And that's the experience of being fully immersed in our daily activities. That means, you know, uh, having work that is, you can devote your full attention to in a way that engages you where you're not totally distracted or even partially distracted. You're really excited if you're an astronomer and you're looking at the stars and uh, focusing on a comet or if you're, you know, really into music and listening to a wonderful symphony. Uh, so engagement is really important. And then the R is relationships. And uh, we should seek to experience positive relationships. Um, social rejection can result in physical pain, actually. And um, as far as relationships are concerned, there's a Harvard study that's been ongoing for 75 years that says, uh, if you wanna be happy, you wanna develop your social connections and your re relationships. It's not the amount of money you accumulate or the accomplishments you have in this world. It's uh, the people who have been, are the happiest in that 75 year study are those who have developed relationships and social connections. And then there's meaning and purpose in your life and connecting to something bigger than us. It's not what we do, but the meaning it has to us. 
So having purpose in life can mitigate disease risk. So you can have less disease risk if you're actually doing meaningful activities. And again, those meaningful activities deal with meaning for you. You don't have to judge yourself by what other people are doing. Um, it's sort of like, what would you want on your, what, what would you want to be remembered for um, at the time of your death? Um, and, and if you're not engaging with meaningful activities, it's kind of hard to get up in the morning sometimes. And I'd encourage you to find what's meaningful to you. And then accomplishment is uh, the last of PERMA. Um, it's accomplishing realistic goals that can bring satisfaction, pride, and fulfillment. Those uh, accomplishments don't bring quite as much joy as meaningful relationships, according to the Harvard study, but still can be helpful in improving your positive emotions. So I think that's all I want to say about those kinds of things. As providers, we uh, try to help our patients uh, or our class members um, adjust their thoughts and perceptions, and that's what these classes are about, to kind of point you to different resources where you can kind of decide for yourself what's important. I want to go over some very practical issues next, and we're almost done with this. It's, it's positive psychology interventions and specific actions that you could be engaged in. And I'll kind of run through these pretty quickly, and then we'll see if any of you are using them. And then we're going to go to some therapeutic lifestyle change issues that you may be engaged in. So let's start out with the positive psychological interventions and specific actions. Number one, what things can you do to increase your positive emotions? You can count your blessings. You know, I mentioned that Dr. Amit Sood in his Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living advises you to Focus on five things you're grateful for every morning before you get out of bed. If that's too many, think of three things that you're grateful or thankful for and do that every single day, whenever you want to do it. If you don't want to do it before you get out of bed, do it before you go to bed or <laughs> sometime throughout the day. The next, expressing gratitude and appreciation. You know, what challenges did you manage this week and uh, what are you grateful for? The next, savoring the pleasant things in life. You know, you could probably spend five minutes in a day on a savoring a particular activity. Uh, the recommendations might be sitting down at a meal and actually savoring uh, that meal. If it takes longer than five minutes, hopefully for you to eat. So you may want to focus your five minute attention on I don't know, the strawberry that's on your plate or the orange or uh, whatever else is on there, how it grew, where it came from, what it's like in this world. Um, it's sort of like meditation. Um, you could also savor a flower that's growing out in your yard or the hummingbird that's buzzing around your yard. Lots of things to savor for five minutes every day. Other things you could do, writing down how one wants to be remembered, like I want people to remember me for, and then complete that, you know, write it out if you, or just think about it. And then another is connecting and interacting with others regularly in person and not solely or mainly through social media regularly practicing acts of kindness like how do you feel after you you are kind to somebody um it can be a very powerful positive emotion that you feel after practicing an act of kindness 
doing activities that feel meaningful, and then thinking about one's happiest days frequently. Like you could look at pictures, uh, think about the emotions you've experienced, those sorts of things. So you have an opportunity to spend a wealth of time in improving your emotional state uh, with your thoughts. Now, if you want to talk about some actions you can perform, therapeutic lifestyle change actions, exercise and physical activity is one, nutrition and dietary patterns, time and nature, supportive relationships, recreation, relaxation, and stress management, religious or spiritual involvement, modification of sleeping patterns, mindful practice, mindfulness practices, and avoidance of risky substance. So I've given you more than a mouthful. Uh, before we talk about becoming what you believe, I'm going to kind of stop for a moment. And we're going to see if anybody has any thoughts about what we've covered just briefly. And... If not, I'm going to go back and carry on a little bit more. So I've got two pages to look at now. And I don't see anybody's hand up as yet. So let me go on to um, now that we know what we can do, what are uh, some of the barriers that may stop us from doing what we know will make us healthier and happier. Because it's an important concept. You know, uh, Scott has mentioned uh, numerous times before uh, that you have to enjoy something if you're gonna keep doing it. Uh, if, if you don't feel good about doing it, uh, that behavior is ultimately going to drop out. It's that old pleasure pain principle. Uh, we kind of tend to go toward things that cause us pleasure uh, and embrace them. And we tend to run from things that cause us pain. And uh, that's one of the reasons we talk about dietary choices and how to make food more attractive and more um, uh, interesting for those people who are making a transition. Because initially, uh, your tongue is kind of not used to transitioning, but your emotions, your, your thoughts are really translated into emotions. And these emotions are going to determine your behaviors. And, and so there are things that you might choose to engage in. Um, and when I mention if, if you don't have a feeling for wanting to do something, like let's say you talk to a couch potato, the couch potato is sitting on the couch and you ask them, why aren't you getting up and exercising? And their response is, well, I just don't feel like it. It just goes to show that emotions will drive the behavior. You don't feel like it. It's not exciting to you. You're not going to do it. Uh, as it turns out, smell and taste are um, significant. They come and affect your emotion center, the limbic center. And uh, if you are in a, a less than positive emotional state, you start to crave comfort foods to make you feel better. And what are those comfort foods in the United States? They're usually the high fat and high sugar kind of foods. And so uh, that can become pretty problematic, particularly if you're having a problem with weight. So let's talk about weight. Okay. Let's talk about weight. Many people lose weight only to regain it in the following months and years. So why does that happen? I'm sure there's a few of you in this room that may have happened to you or to some of your relatives. And psychology actually plays a huge part. 
Uh, when someone loses a significant amount of body weight, but does not change their belief about who they are, they tend to gain it right back. Even though they have the knowledge and the information, they know what's healthiest for them. But the belief about themselves as a person and what their body image should be and what it looks like, if it's not altered, um, they're going to kind of drift back to where they were before they got started. Some of this is bound up in how we were talked to when we were younger, how we were treated, the adverse childhood events that we've suffered, uh, our friends, neighbors, co-workers, bosses have used terminology that have led to us talking negatively or not feeling worth it. So I want to read to you um, about three beliefs that are fundamentally important in order to experience long-term success with behavior change. The first is, it's important that I prioritize my health and well-being. So if you if you're not prioritizing that, it's going to be pretty difficult to make any significant change that will stick. But the good news is it's never too late to benefit from optimal lifestyle. The next issue or belief is this will work for me. If you do not believe that it's going to make any difference in your life to change what you're eating, you don't think that the science is really uh, for you, and I didn't think that it would affect me. I was a total non-believer back about 12 years ago. I thought this is for someone else. Um, but if you don't believe it will work for you, this is not going to work. Uh, but even if you do believe it, there's a third issue, which may be a barrier to you maintaining this journey toward health. And this is this third core belief required for long-term success often goes unrecognized. For many people, credible sources and unfortunate life experiences have taught them that they do not deserve good things in life. Tragically, they have formed a belief that they are not valuable and of importance. Individuals who have developed such a belief have no ambition to strive for a better life. But every person has tremendous value and incredible worth and deserves a life of health and wholeness. Worth is not based on what we do or what we own or how broken we may be. You are valuable just because you are and you deserve health and wholeness. Embracing this belief will empower you to overcome many roadblocks in the way of living your best life. This is from a course that I took. It's called the CHIP course. Um, it's now converted to Pixio or something like that. I can't remember what the name is. Do you remember, Scott? Yes. Uh, it's written down here. But um, I, I shared it with the class this afternoon and it seemed to resonate with them a bit. And so I thought I would share this with you tonight before we go on. So anybody in this class who may be struggling, who's had yo-yo weight gain, uh, I would encourage you to give some serious thought to how you're feeling about yourself as a person and whatever you can do to change your thought process. And that may come from counseling, it may come from meditation, it may come from attending these classes. There are many uh, ways in which you can take yourself out of this, what I call a black hole of, um, of lack of self-worth. 
uh, it's time for you to, to do that for your sake. And with that said, I want to get on to the topic of forgiveness. Because we started out these series talking about you've got to get rid of the junk in the trunk. And the junk in the trunk also had to do with what? It had to do with, in your mind, carrying around the hurts uh, and the anger, resentment that you've developed over the years from people that have hurt you. And we've all been hurt. Um, whether we develop health or remain ill or develop illness can be related to this. And so it would be good for you to learn what others have done in terms of dealing with the junk that may be in your brain that's not allowing you to have the best life. So with that said, I've got, a, I'm gonna roam on back to the videos. We're gonna go to the forgiveness section. And after we get to the forgiveness section, let's see, gotta find it here. I think it's under 16. Uh, okay, right here. We're gonna start by what you need to do to deal with this. And it's called reframing your thoughts about what happened. It doesn't mean that you're forgiving the person, you're reframing the events of what happened. So let's listen to this. Right, I'm Edward, and this is a pictorial representation of what I mean by reframing, okay? Reframing is taking a frame that someone has around a particular subject or situation, the frame through which they're looking at it, think of it like a window frame, and often when they're in conflict, they're looking through a particular frame and all they're getting is, in this case, a bunch of black smoke, all right? A lot of dark, they're caught up in what's bad, okay? And actually, if you look at it, that bit is bad, okay? Now, what we want to do when we reframe is to take that frame and change its position. We want to make it, either, often, we can just make it bigger, okay? So we take the frame that the person is using to look at the world and enlarge it so that they can change their perspective. This is a really important part of conflict resolution, is helping people get a new perspective on their situation. Now, this might seem a little bit far-fetched for them at the time, but let's just take the case here that this is a chimney, all right? And this is actually a house, and there's a window here, and there's another window here, and actually there's a, a river out here. Now, you don't have to necessarily look just at the smoke or the house. You might want to choose to focus and look at the forest that's over here as well. But people will get, forget the, the, whole, the overall picture. They'll forget the good things. They'll forget the nice bits. They'll focus on what's bad. And what we want to do when we're reframing is change that view, whether it's over here or larger. That's reframing. OK. That's kind of the brief introduction. And now we're gonna get down to a couple people who have dealt with forgiveness. And uh, some of these are pretty uh, potent. Let's start with the journey of forgiveness right here. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Mrs. Ellen Rutledge. My name is Ellen Rutledge. I am employed here at Ironwood State Prison as secretary to the Chief Deputy Warden, Mr. Neil McDowell. Like many of you, I always thought that my family would be blessed with a long and happy life together. But God did not include that in our life plan. On the morning of October 22, 2008, our lives were tragically changed forever. At approximately 4.30 in the morning, my only son, 
Michael, stepped out of his house, preparing to go to work. As he was loading up his truck, he was approached by two armed robbers wearing ski masks. He was brutally beaten. He was fatally shot in the head, execution style, while he was on his hands and knees. The only physical thing that those robbers took was his wallet. At the time of his murder, Michael was 35 years old. This picture was taken just a few months before he was murdered. He and his wife had been married for 13 years. They had two young children. They owned their own home in a nice neighborhood. And they were living what we all call the American dream. When I was given the news that my son had been murdered, thus began my long ride on an emotional roller coaster. My emotions ran from disbelief to bargaining with God and many nights of grief and despair. You see, as a mother, it's my natural instincts to fix whatever problems my children might have. But I couldn't fix this. To this day, I still have a hard time understanding how anything so unforgivable could happen to any family, but it does. One of the most difficult things we as humans are ever called upon to do is to respond to evil with kindness and to forgive the unforgivable. We love to read stories and watch movies about people who respond to hatred with love. And yet when that very thing is required of us, our default seems to be one of anger, bitterness, or vengeance. If you don't practice forgiveness, you might be the one who pays the most dearly. So the kindest thing you can do for yourself is to forgive the unforgivable. Lewis B. Smeads, professor and author of many popular books, including Forgive and Forget, is quoted. To forgive is to set a prisoner free, only to discover that the prisoner was you. Since the murder of my son in 2008, I have journeyed down a thousand emotional roads seeking the answers to, can I, will I, ever forgive those two young men who chose to kill my son instead of just taking his wallet and walking away? No rational answer has ever given me the solace that I seek. During the past five years, I have eased off the freeway of pure anguish and I now travel on a frontage road of acceptance. I have searched my soul time and time again, and I have come to know that I am no longer identified as a victim, but rather I am a strong, positive, and resilient woman. Be assured we all have the ability to forgive, but it may not happen in one false swoop. Sometimes it has to happen in layers. Sometimes we have to forgive someone many times before we can let go of all of the emotional residue of the past. We can take inspiration from the words of Nelson Mandela, who was imprisoned for 27 years by the South African government. He says, as I stepped out the door toward my freedom, I knew that if I did not leave all the anger, hatred, and resentment behind, I would still be in prison. So how do we know if we have achieved forgiveness? If you have taken the steps to restore peace in your heart, you will feel a shift. You will no longer feel sorrow over the circumstance. You will 
No longer feel angry with that person. You'll feel sorry for them instead. And you will tend to not have anything else to say about the situation at all. You will feel lighter. And you will know in your heart that you have given yourself the ultimate gift. Thank you. I have one last video for you, and it's Forgiveness in an Unforgiving World. So I want to tell you about a man named Azim. So Azim was born to a family of business owners in Kenya, and they fled violence there to immigrate to the U.S. He ended up working as an investment banker based in San Diego, and he had two children, Tariq and Tasreen. One morning, Azim was drinking tea in his kitchen when the phone rang, and it was a police officer calling to tell him that his 20-year-old son, Tariq, had been shot and killed. Azim didn't believe it. It was impossible. Tariq was a dedicated college student who dreamed of becoming a National Geographic photographer. He and his fiancée, Jennifer, planned to move to New York City when they graduated. So Azim called Jennifer to clear this up. But unfortunately, she confirmed that it was true. That the night before, while working a shift delivering pizza for an Italian restaurant, Tariq had been shot by a group of teenagers. Azim dropped the phone and passed out on the kitchen floor. When he came to, this one mysterious phrase rang in his mind. There were victims on both ends of the gun. There were victims on both ends of the gun. So around 15,000 people are murdered in the U.S. each year. And the people who love them face a question. Can they forgive? Or can they not? If you were Tariq's parents, could you forgive? Is forgiveness even possible? I'm a skeptical journalist. I write about tough subjects like war, addiction, the challenges of immigrating to a new country, even terminal illness. I'm not writing for Hallmark here. And I'm especially obsessed with how people overcome the most difficult challenges. A couple of years ago, I started to wonder how forgiveness might fit into that equation. I wasn't very forgiving at the time. At 33, I was struggling to make a living and fuming over yet another breakup. I was bitter and angry, and I didn't want to live that way. So I set out on an international adventure that lasted almost two years and turned into a book. I talked to scientists, therapists, and trauma survivors. I interviewed people about forgiving parents and violent offenders. And I traveled to Rwanda to explore the question of forgiveness after genocide. I asked people how they forgave and how it changed them. And I studied the role of seeking forgiveness, too, and programs that facilitate it in schools and communities. So what is forgiveness, anyway? Put it into Google, and you get images like this. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but that is not appealing to me. <laughs> Luckily, Merriam-Webster's defines forgiveness as giving up resentment. Giving up resentment doesn't mean excusing. It doesn't rule out justice. It doesn't require reconciliation. I interviewed people with abusive parents, and some forgave and reconciled, and others forgave and never spoke to that parent again. But either way, they gave up resentment. Now, I'm not saying we can't be angry. Anger is a natural response to pain and injustice. 
Anger motivates action. It's when anger hardens into bitterness and resentment that it becomes dangerous. Nelson Mandela said, "Resentment is like swallowing poison and waiting for your enemy to die." It turns out that's true. Research shows that exploding in angry outbursts and repressing anger both increase your risk of heart attack over time. Did you know resentment can damage your brain? Every time you think bitterly about that person who cut you off in traffic <laughs> or denied your raise request, your brain is flooded with stress chemicals that limit your ability to problem solve and make you more depressed. On the other hand, studies show forgiveness can lower blood pressure, depression, and anxiety. Now, blame doesn't only hurt us, though. It hurts other people too. The psychological description of blame is to discharge pain and discomfort. To discharge pain and discomfort. Blame creates bullying, self-loathing, and war. Blame is violent, and forgiveness can stop the violence. You don't have to look far to see what happens when there is no forgiveness. There's estranged relatives who can barely remember why they stopped speaking. There's the war in Israel and Palestine. Now, I'm not suggesting that forgiveness can bring peace to the Middle East, but I am suggesting that the recent war in Gaza is an example of what happens when two groups are unwilling to seek and grant forgiveness. So when I started this exploration, I didn't think I was violent, but I was blaming myself for not accomplishing certain things, and that was violent. I was blaming the world for not giving me what I wanted, and that was violent. When I started being compassionate with myself, and I stopped blaming the world for my disappointments, it changed my life. So, you may have noticed that we're expecting a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I've been I've been thinking a lot about what I want for my son. I hope he gives people the benefit of the doubt when they make mistakes, especially me. <laughs> I hope people forgive him when he screws up. And that he apologizes when he hurts people's feelings. I hope his classmates look to him for leadership and love, and that when he strikes out in the last inning, his teammates forgive him and encourage him to see failure not as a reason to hate himself, but as a tool to get better. I hope he can go to school without fearing getting shot by someone who's resentful over something that happened in the past. Forgiveness isn't about the past; it's about the future, and that future starts now, with small choices, like realizing that your spouse yelled because she was tired, and not yelling back, listening more, and judging less, not beating yourself up for that mis that mistake you made a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, or this morning. So remember Azim, the international investment banker who lost his son Tariq to a shooting while he was delivering a pizza. Azim decided to forgive his, the killer of his son, Tony. He learned that Tony was a troubled 14-year-old kid who was trying to impress a group of older gang members when he shot at Tariq. Azim went to visit Tony in prison and forgave him. And Tony wept and apologized. Azim reached out to Tony's grandfather too, and today they speak together to students in packed auditoriums like this one. They take the stage, and Azim says, 
His only grandson shot and killed my only son. But we're best friends. And we're here today because we know that each and every one of you is special. And we don't want any of you to end up dead or in prison. So I want to leave you with one question tonight. What's possible on the other side of seeking and granting forgiveness? Getting a good night's sleep for once? Having a happy marriage? Ending a war? What do you think is possible for you and for the world? So that brings us to your thoughts. Has anybody had experience with forgiveness and forgiving someone else in their life? A run? I just want to say beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's pretty pretty emotional stuff. Um, uh, this is not generally um, the kind of class we present, but it's been very powerful in my experience in the past um, for people to focus their attention on how important this is. Um, we all live with hurts, and uh, if there's a way that we can learn to forgive, uh, either through reframing or whatever, um, it can be very helpful to get us back on the track to happiness. Anybody else? Had any experience with forgiving someone and what it did for you or not forgiving someone and how it's affected your life, perhaps? Yeah, it's a heavy personal topic, but uh, if anyone's willing to share, there's no no judgment, no judgment here ever. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm 80 years old, and about a year ago, I forgave my father for something, and I held on to held on to that for uh, you know 65 years, I guess, and it impacted. We still had a decent relationship. But it was always there, and uh, it's a little late, but better late than never, I guess. How did you feel after that? Oh, better, and you know, I started, you know, instead of that being one of the first things that when I think of him, one of the first things that would pop up in my mind, I'd think about, you know, the good things he did uh, for our relationship. So. It's a relief. Thanks. It's a Thanks. relief. Thank you for sharing that. I had an experience. Um, uh, I started my first medical practice almost 1550. That's half a century ago with um, one of a classmate from medical school. We practiced together for a year and then we got into a bad um, uh, divorce. We weren't really married, but we were married in the business sense, uh, covering each other's practices together. And um, uh, we wound up reporting each other to the state medical board for various issues. And it was really a, um, a painful time for me. And I held on to that and the resentment and the anger for many, many years, I think it was close to 40 or 45, 40 years, I guess. And um, I decided to move back to Oak Ridge where we were practicing and he was still practicing there. I decided to call him up and tell him that uh, we had a pretty rocky course, but I was going to focus my attention on the the good things that we shared when we were in medical school and when we first started practice together. And I was going to now 
just throw out the times that we had such a horrible uh, interactions, uh, anger and frustration with each other. It felt uh, like a burden lifted off of my shoulders and he actually came and knocked on my door and we chatted for a couple minutes. And it's not that we're great friends right now, but just going through the motion like that was uh, was very helpful for me. And one of the reasons why I, I like to share these videos um, with you. Arun, was your, is your hand newly raised? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, agree with everything that was said in the videos and what you are saying. And I, I think some, some of you may have heard this saying that to err is human to forgive divine. Oh. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it has been my experience too that we make mistakes and uh, the best thing is to forgive. It's not forgiving doesn't mean to forget everything, but to choose to not hold grudges against the person and so on. Because yes. like that lady said, and like our spiritual teacher says, knife is a double-edged sword. You know, I mean, it's a, it hurts the person who is holding the knife and the person who is poked in, just like the gun. So yeah, it's best to, best to not uh, be that, uh, you know, holding on to that anger and resentment and all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Care to share any of their experiences for the group's sake, for your own sake? I don't know where I heard it, but I've, I've always also heard, you know, life is short, love a lot, forgive quickly. So, you know, just don't carry grudges. Yep. So I don't know how many people actually showed up today. There were a few. Nancy. Yeah, um, I listened to this um, deal on online just the other day, which was very, very interesting. And it was the idea, which I'd heard it before, but this guy has the idea that there is no free will. And that, um, you know, you don't have a choice in things. And he was using it as a, a um, one of the things he was talking about was um, if you go to a prison and talk to the, you know, the people who have been in prison, that hardly any of them had had like a parent that would sit down and read with them when they were kids. And so there's so much... You know, when people hurt you, a lot of times it's because they've already been hurt. And it's just like, you know, they that's what they, they're they kind of programmed to do. And I just thought it was really, really, really an interesting concept. I, you know, I'm not sure that I totally agree with it, but it, it's just something to, to, you know, kind of open your mind, I guess. Yeah, if you... If you uh, really have an understanding that one's life experiences uh, lead to behavior that may be uh, unconscious to a large degree, then you really are not using a lot of free will and uh, you're just kind of reacting to what's happened to you over time. I suspect there are a number of people who do. Anybody else? Interesting. Yeah. Sometimes we take risks in this class by dealing with topics that are uh, a little heavy. Uh, we generally are pretty light with the food and the science, uh, but Tonight, uh, we decided to kind of uh, take off on a little bit 
a deeper tangent. Uh, I'd love to give you some homework. Uh, it's not anything you need to share with anybody. But it's uh, homework that goes something like this. Go home, pull out a piece of paper, and write a note. A note of forgiveness to someone who you are really ticked off with, who really has uh, hurt you uh, in some way. You don't have to share it with the person, but write out what your feelings are and the circumstance that came about and why you feel the way you do. Look it over, read it again, see if you want to adjust it a little bit. Um, expand the window, uh, stepping back and seeing what led to you even interacting with this person in the first place, the many interactions you may have had, some of which may have actually been positive and um, see if that results in some lightening of the load that you're carrying around in your brain. That was one of the exercises that um, we encourage people in the CHIP program uh, to do. And um, it may or may not be helpful for you, but I'd encourage you all to consider doing that. Well, it will certainly help us, yeah. I have done the same thing, although what I have done is um, written a letter of anger of everything that I was mad about, everything that caused concern, and just kind of captured my feelings on paper. Mm -hmm. And then I put the letter away, you know, and then uh, a lot of times I'll make uh, for New Year's or my birthday or maybe just because I'll take that letter out, not reread it, but know that I was able to express myself and then usually burn it uh, and just kind of allow that uh, to just disperse. It really is um, freeing, you know, I mean, in that you have to forgive that person or however you get through it. But being able to express myself without putting that on that person, but still being able to get it out, uh, I found very helpful. Thanks for sharing that. And I think many others might find it helpful. Anyone else? I thought it was kind of interesting that there was a war in uh, Palestine, uh, Israel, back in 2014 when this video was made. And now there's the war again at this time. <laughs> Similar sentiment. All right, next week, what are we going to do? We're going to have an open forum, Scott? Yep, open forum next week. And then week after that, uh, I'm doing my nutritional myths and other popular diets class. That's what's coming up next couple weeks. Sounds great. Um, I'll run. Oh, I wanted to share an example of forgiveness <laughs> that just happened to me recently. Okay. Uh, I'll make it real quick, but I went to the Y a couple of days ago and I did something which was basically chewing on much more than I can take, that I can put in my mouth. I I had been doing like an exercise where you jump up on a big block and I had been doing that up to 20 inches but then I said oh today I'll try the 24 inches thing and I did it after two or three times one of my knees started giving real pain and I said why did I have to do that <laughs> but I decided to forgive myself for doing that silly mistake uh, so I, today I didn't go to the Y, but I'll go there tomorrow and be care more careful. That's all. 
Yeah. I love that you end this session about mm -hmm. forgiveness for yourself because that's probably one of the most important uh, uh, lessons or education that that I hope can come out of a session like this. Uh, learning to forgive yourself is so important and can make the difference as to whether you achieve your goals or whether you sabotage them. Wow. Um, anything else to add, Scott? We're good? Well, speaking of the why, if anyone here is already familiar with the, our in-person classes at the YMCA on Sundays, we're starting a new class series. It's going to be 12 weeks this time, starting on Sunday, April 14th from 2 to 3.30. So if you want to sign up, uh, you can put your go to the homepage of eugeneplantbasedproviders.com. And here it is. You can put your name, your full name, your phone number, email, click send, and you can uh, join join the classes in person. Just wanted to show you guys that. Speaking of a room, we talked about the YMCA. That's where they're being held at, the YMCA here in Eugene. That's great. And again, for the new members uh, who are not aware that we do have people who will help you one-on-one, -on -one, either talk to you by phone or Zoom uh, to answer your questions, to help you on your path, your journey to transitioning. Um, I'm one of those that's available to do that on a regular basis. The cost is zero. Close your eyes. What do you see? That's the cost, nothing. Um, and, um, you know, we want to provide support for you all that works. And that could be classes like on Zoom. It could be classes in person. It could be one-on-one -on -one sessions. So, Charlie, if we have a specific topic, which is why I'm here, how do we bring that up so that it can either be talked about as a group or get someone on one time with you or Scott or somebody else, specifically oh, pre-diabetes diagnosis. So, diabetes. Uh, pre-diabetes five yeah. point nine. So and there, there are se sessions that are archived on diabetes that started out. Um, or have have we done them this year, Scott? I no, think no, they're coming up in several weeks. But if you didn't want to wait that long. Uh, you can go back to the class archives on the Live Lifestyle Medicine website to 2023. And you'll see the diabetes class. But also, if you if you can, you're available to come next week. It's an open forum, so you can bring up that question and we can discuss it right there. Again, okay. you could yeah, call, also call Charlie, and you guys could have an appointment. Also, Lisa Chick, our fourth year medical student that does the free health coaching. Uh, on the class newsletter down at the very bottom of the weekly class newsletter, there's a link yeah. to sign up with her. Also, very good. Thank you. And, you know, just feel free to send Lisa a note or send me a note. I think my email's on there somewhere, isn't it, Scott? Yeah, it's under our contact us on the class website. Okay. Yeah. Section. We do. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. A run. Uh, just a quick question about the Y class series yes. that's happening starting next week. Will it be similar to what we did last sessions or will it be more expansive or whatever, you know? So it starts on April 14th and it's going to be 12 sessions instead of eight sessions. So uh, it's going to be similar content, the eight and then four more classes, which you've probably been involved in uh, to a degree uh, by attending so many of these Zoom classes. So sure. I I don't think you're going to miss a whole lot, but if you enjoy coming in person, then it's worth coming. And if you are good with the Zoom, that's fine also. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And we're, we're playing, and, we're, and we're planning to do more cooking demonstrations, small group sessions, the next round than we even did this past round. So we're 
we have a meeting coming up this Saturday to kind of plan out our curriculum for the next 12 week cycle. Thank you. Well, um, thank you all for your participation and um, um, we are grateful for all of you, uh, for your interest and hope you have a wonderful week. And Scott, thank you so much. All the yeah, rest good, of you. Good talk and we hope to see you guys next week. Good night. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great evening. Hey, thanks.